Good morning, everyone. Um, I see a lot of people from around the world already joining us, which is absolutely excellent. I uh, hope everyone can hear me. Welcome to day three of the Cambridge Live Experience presented jointly by Cambridge Assessment English and Cambridge University Press. Uh, my name is Matthew Santisfer. I'm the um, regional manager for Cambridge University Press in MENA. And whether this is your first session or you've participated in several over the past few days, um, Nala Al-Malki is going to talk about keeping your learners physically distanced but socially engaged. And Nala is an ELT consultant based between the KSA and UAE. She holds a master's in TESOL from the University of Manchester, as well as a Delta and a CELTA. She's collaborated with many different ministries of education, language centers, publishing houses, including her favorite Cambridge University Press. Um, you now that works quite closely with us. And she has worked on educational reform initiatives around the region. She has a special interest in teacher education, particularly in the area of teacher beliefs. And she's a certified CELTA trainer with in-depth experience training teachers in public and private sectors. So Nala is going to present for about 30 minutes today, and then the last 15 minutes of the session will be a Q&A. So please, as Nala is presenting, you can keep chatting in the chat box with comments, but if you do have a question, uh, please use the Q&A box, and at the end, we will try to take as many questions as we can for Nala in the final 15 minutes. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Nala and her expertise. She's always engaging, insightful, and entertaining. So please relax, sit back, and let Nala take you through uh, this fantastic session. Thank you very much, Matt. Good morning, everybody, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's been really nice to see um, so many different countries. Unfortunately, I don't have the um, multilingual skills that Matt has, so I can't be saying good morning to each and every one of you in all your languages. But um, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. I hope you've enjoyed the um, Cambridge Live experience so far. I personally did. Um, there's been some incredible sessions about a variety of topics. Um, and it's really amazing to see how much we are learning from each other in these uncertain times as we go into a new um, arena. Now, as Matt said, um, I will aim to have the session as interactive as possible. So I will ask you every once in a while to type things in the chat box. Um, but for specific questions, we'll probably deal with those um, at the end. But I will be asking you questions, so please make sure that you are using the chat box when needed. All right, so the topic of my session today is keeping our learners physically distanced, uh, but socially engaged through collaboration, inquiry, and ownership. And um, I'm sure that you've seen over the past few days, if you attended some sessions, a lot of sessions are uh, linked to this topic. Um, while, of course, each one will have its different angle. So let me give you a quick overview of what I'll be covering today. So first of all, we're going to talk about the new normal. We're going to talk about what it looks like for, um, for everybody, because it's going to be different from one context to the other, depending on rules and regulations in your country, uh, depending on the capabilities of your school or university or center that you're working in. We're going to talk about some of the dangers and the pitfalls that we might risk going into as we return into the classrooms. Um, we're going to try to reflect on the lessons that we've learned from this online experience and from being online for quite a few months and having to go online so quickly as well in a very quick um, change that happens in February, March for some of us. I'm going to talk about why engagement is important anyway to start with. Why are we um, why do we want our students engaged in the classroom? Hopefully we should all kind of believe in that as well. And then we're going to try to think of ways to work around the new normal to continue to keep our learners engaged and um, socially connected um, in the classroom. And then we'll follow up with some final tips and um, kind of principles that you can continue to carry on as you move on to your classroom. So first of all, I'd like to hear from you. Can you tell me in your own context, whether you're going on, you're staying online or you're going face to face or following some sort of hybrid format, what does the new normal look for you? Um, specifically, probably for people who are returning into the classroom, can you tell me a bit more about how um, it's going to be set up? Please use the chat box, online, blended, hybrid, face-to-face. -face. Good, so the ones that are face-to-face, -face, what kind of um, setup 
are you going to have? Good. A lot of you are staying online, but a lot also are having a hybrid model, which I believe will be some students being on camera and some students live or a staggered starts or week on, week on and week off. Okay, great. Yes, a very, very wide um, mix, which is what I expected really having such high numbers. Great. So to sum up, what um, I'm, my session is talking more about being face to face rather than online. Um, but what I think is a common thing that will carry through different contexts in different places is that obviously we're going to have to have that distance amongst us, um, one and a half to two meters between desks. Everything should be measured. The students cannot get close to each other. Um, some schools will be putting up these shields or, or um, partitions on their desk to make sure that students are not interacting too closely. Uh, some of us will be requiring to, required to wear masks and some of us with shields, some of us actually none of this as well. So it really depends on where you are. There's a lot of schools that are going to be keeping their children or their students in bubbles and in pods staying together throughout the day. Some of them will go in, you'll be going to the extent of having stickers around your desks um, to make sure that you don't cross this boundary and nobody else comes as well. So it's, it's interesting to see um, the differences, but obviously there are a lot of common, um, common things that we're going to see in different classrooms. But the interesting part is when you ask somebody what the new normal um, looks like for them, they'll automatically just say, you know, the distance, the mask, the desks, but um, nobody really talks much about the methodology. Nobody talks about the, um, how we're going to teach the approaches, the activities. And I think we need to start shifting our mindset as teachers away from that. So instead of thinking, oh, we're going to face to face, we have to stay apart. We're going to face to face. We have to think how we're gonna keep our students connected. So we're gonna to need to think about the mindsets, the activities, the methods, and the motivating approaches. Because hopefully already in your classroom, you already uh, pre-COVID, pre-pandemic, you already tried to keep your learners as engaged as much as possible. So what we're trying to do here today is just make sure that we continue to do this working around the current scenario that we have. So kind of to sum up what I just said, I've got this quote here, but it's missing some words. Um, can you try to finish in the gaps and put it in the chat box? So the focus as countries begin to open school should not be limited to blank, but should also emphasize and focus on blank. What do you think um, could be the dis yes, yes, Nicoletta here said social distancing. Good. So what, sh yeah, good. So it should not be focused only on health and physical distancing but should also focus on, emphasize on education. Great. Yes, and that's exactly what it says. So we shouldn't just be focusing on health and safety, but we need to also focus on the quality of education that we're giving our learners, um, because otherwise, why are they going into the classroom if they don't have that good quality education? So let's reflect a bit on the lessons that we've learned um, by being online. And this is gathered from different sources, from working with teachers over the past few months, um, from me attending these sessions and hearing about different teachers and what they've done uh, from research, from statistics. There's a lot of data that came out and it's quite interesting to see how fast we were able to learn from this experience because we were put under this pressure. So and I think one of the main lessons that we've learned is that um, our expectations and our assumptions were not always on point. Um, when we went online, so a lot of teachers were pleasantly surprised uh, by their students' abilities to adapt very quickly, uh, by their ability to work individually and independently, by their ability to find cre creative ways to work collaboratively. Um, what was good to see as well is how quickly the level of guidance that was needed changed. So a lot of students were on their own able to kind of fix things and get, take matters into their own hands. The role of the teacher changed at some point um, so, so a lot of um, assumptions that we had about online learning or about using technology kind of changed very, very quickly. Um, what's interesting to see as well is the uh, unlocked abilities and potential that we had. So I've heard a lot of this from different educators is that a lot of our students actually thrived in the online context. And this depended on a lot of things, um, their personality, um, their level of independence, um, the, the obviously the situation they had at home or wherever they were studying but at the same time we can't neglect the other side where there's a lot of students that actually struggled they lagged behind they didn't feel very comfortable 
Um, and I'll give a personal example here. Um, my son, who's um, six and a half years old now, and you know, on this online experience, his reading actually excelled quite quickly um, because he was taking out of that box. So while initially um, he was only going through reading a few paragraphs and a few lines, within that lockdown period where he was um, online, he actually went very quickly to reading full chapter books and doing all of that because he didn't feel restricted by why the, what, what the school group was doing because he had um, this space to explore on his own. While a lot of his peers that were actually right on the same level with him when they were still at school um, lagged behind. Um, and that's probably also because of personality type, because of um, the environment around them. It, it, it's such a detailed and complex situation, which brings us to the next point is that we have a renewed sensitivity to learner differences. We realize how much it matters, uh, how different styles, different preferences, different abilities make such a big um, effect on our learning or on our learners' learning. So we really need to pay attention to these bits uh, because these areas kind of surfaced a lot more in the online, um, in the online model. Um, we suddenly had a restored appreciation of life skills. And by life skills here, I mean um, resilience, for example, the interaction with change, our ability to problem solve, and um, our time management skills, our resource organization, all of these things that perhaps were probably taken care of for you at school or university or the center you were in. But now when the students had to go online, we realize how important it is for us to actually pay attention to these kind of skills and prepare our students uh, to use them in a much more effective way. Um, this one, I think we can all take a sigh of relief here. As teachers, we finally got the confirmation that robots cannot replace us. Uh, there's a lot of talk before over the past decade that um, can everybody just learn by apps and, and platforms, etc. But we think what we realize now is, no, it's not really um, the case. We still need that human element. We still need that teachers. I see a lot of people saying here, hooray. Um, they're also relieved. We do need the teacher because whether we like it or not, the teacher really is the most important tool here and the teacher is the one that will kind of make or break the learning environment. Um, so we kind of um, appreciated the teacher more, appreciated the teacher role more and realized how much training and um, attention we need to pay to our teachers as well. And one of the most important things, and I think I've heard this a lot, it was more like a recurrent theme throughout the conference, is that uh, learning is dialogic. It's um, the teachers who went into the classroom or the online classroom and they were vulnerable and they completely were honest with their students and they said, hey, this is new for me. I don't know how to do this. I'm exploring it. I'm learning it just as you are. They actually um, did the best in the classroom because they kept it open and they took feedback um, and they took the learners' voices into consideration. And this was the same case as well. I mean, I'm talking more about adult learning, but even in schools and early learning centers. These schools that involve the students and involve the parents in making decisions and reflecting on the experience week by week, um, they managed to create a better experience at the end. While those that went in and said, okay, this is the way it's gonna happen. I'm gonna stick to what I planned. Um, they kind of suffered a lot. Um, and then finally, most importantly, is that the idea is that one size does not fit all. I mean, we knew this from before, but again, the online experience made us believe this even more. Um, there won't be one model or one way or one kind of material or method that works for everybody. It's going to um, need some tailoring and some catering. So what are the dangers now as we go out into the classroom? The idea is that a lot of us were sat at home as teachers and students, and we were learning at our own pace. We were learning in the comfort of our own homes, and we were used to a certain way of learning, a certain structure. Um, while for the teachers, for example, they had to be much more uh, structured in the way they used their online time because it was kind of precious, that interaction they had with their learners. So just as we kind of struggled a bit as we shifted very quickly from face to face to online to make that adapt adapt um, adaptation, it's going to be the same for us to go back into face to face. Uh, we might be stuck a bit in the way that we were doing things online. So the idea is that there might be some fixation on how online learning went. Um, and the biggest danger I see is that um, while the desks are separate, they sat in a line and they're kind of stuck to the floor in some places, that automatically gives us the feel that, okay, we need to be in the front, we need to be talking and the students need to be listening and that's it. We're going back to an older approach to learning, which I'm not saying is entirely bad. So there's place and time for this. There's certain subjects, there's some certain fields that you can do that kind of learning in. But I feel if we are talking about teaching a language or learning a language, 
it needs to be interactive, it needs to be engaging. Um, and I'm not saying that this is kind of a lazy thing that teachers were going to be doing, but it's actually kind of a, a coping mechanism, um, you know, because we're all made so um, aware or so, we're so vigilant about the idea of health and safety and distance. So we automatically feel like, okay, so we just need to keep talking and keep them apart, which is a very big problem. Um, because if we rely on nomination, for example, if, if Ali and Ahmed and Abir and Salwa and Andre um, can only talk when they're called for by the teacher, um, their uh, opportunity to collaborate or to contribute to the class is going to dramatically drop, which is not what we want, especially in a language learning context. But we need to bear in mind with all of these things is that we should not just dump what we've learned before. We, we don't hit the reset button. We've learned a lot from the online experience. We've gathered a lot of material, attended a lot of things, um, adapted beautifully to so many different elements. So we still need to use what we had, but we need to work around the new um, situation. And here are some of the things that I've heard teachers say. I'm not gonna go through all of them because I know we've got not that much time. So one of the biggest concerns is speaking activities. How are we gonna do speaking activities while our students are wearing masks and they can't read each other's lips and they can't really talk that loudly and the sound will be muffled? How are they going to work in groups when they can't be close to each other? How are they going to work on projects and posters and materials when they can't share materials? They can't share markers and posters and pens and tablets and all that stuff. Um, learners can't work together anymore because they've lost some of these social skills. They don't know now how to take turns and share and do these things. Specifically, we're talking more about young learners in this situation. Uh, a lot of learners might be demotivated. And this is actually, I've heard this now from quite a few friends who spent, sent their kids back to school, maybe it might not be applicable to adults as much, is that their kids actually came back home crying because they expected something different. They wanted to hug their friends, to play with them, to run around, but it was much, much restricted and it needed a bit of, um, uh, you know, they, they missed that comfort that they had at school. And then finally, the whole idea of the learning pace, how learners had a lot more time at home to take things in, let them sink in before um, uh, being able to produce or create. But what I'd like to highlight here, again, emphasize, is that physical distance does not mean disengaged learning. Um, we just need a bit of tweaks, a bit of reworking, a bit of recycling and repurposing. Uh, we need to have that growth mindset that we keep telling our students to have. We can't think, okay, we're going to the classroom, they're sitting apart, there's nothing I can do about it. No, we need to think that it is possible. Um, it is possible to work around. So why is it so important for us to be engaged in the classroom? Put very simply, what, what is engagement anyway? It, engagement is just active participation and involvement in learning activities, which means really, when I say active participation, it means on different levels, the mental level, the physical level, the psychological level, uh, employing different skills. So really being fully in the experience on different levels. And I found a quote here, which I really, really liked, um, that talks about having your students engaged versus giving your students handouts or giving your students page one, activity three, workbook, page four. Um, which says, I'd rather have one day of authentic engagement than a career in handing out worksheets. Um, this is not what we want. We don't want our students going page to page doing mind-numbingly boring activities. We need more than that, um, which is hopefully what we're gonna try to do today. Um, now, I've taken here an engagement model or framework, if you want to call it, from a very relevant book, actually, that got published now during this time, although it wasn't specifically made for social distancing or online learning. Um, it's about the uh, engagement in contemporary language classrooms. Um, and what I found is that the model that they suggest here, uh, it's by Sarah Mercer and Dornier, um, it's very much applies to our context of going back to face-to-face. -to -face. So this model kind of looks at teachers as instructional designers. So the idea is that our job is kind of to design the experience for our learners or design the activities or redesign the activities. And it relies on four or three things. So first of all is willingness. So that willingness to engage, where does it come from? And that comes from the social element, that bond that you form with your students, the rapport that you build with them. The idea is that your students will feel uh, that they can trust you, uh, that they can confide in you, and also that peer um, feeling or that peer connection that they have with their colleagues in the classroom. And to fit in with my um, session and my topic, this is the part that talks about collaboration. 
So if we, we, if we want that willingness, we have to create that sense of collaboration in the classroom. And then we talk about the trigger. So we've created the willingness to engage, and then we need that trigger. So that trigger is usually the hook or the curious element that gets them um, interested or engaged in your session. And in my part, this is the inquiry element. So this is when we get them to question, to think, to analyze, to synthesize. And then finally, the idea is that we need to maintain this engagement, maintain that flow. And that, um, again, could be done through variety, surprise, different experiences. And for me as well, in my um, talk, I'm going to link that to the idea of ownership, having that reflection and responsible feeling towards your own work that keeps you um, engaged. So as I said, willingness will connect to collaboration, trigger an inquiry and maintenance with ownership. And obviously, as I mentioned before, this is applicable to both the online and the face-to-face -face context. And um, I encourage you really to go have a look at that um, talk by Sarah Mercer. It's from the, uh, one of the recent Cambridge events as well. You can find it on YouTube, um, which talks a lot about things that will be very, very relevant to our context as we go back to the classroom. Because all of these things that I'm gonna talk about today are not really new. Um, they're things that we've done before, things that we've used consistently, but the idea is that we have to now be more aware of them to make sure that we can still achieve them despite all of the new regulations. So what do we need to work around? As we said, a good solid pedagogy was always needed in any context. Whether the students look like these birds, that they're sat in bigger groups closer to each other, not wearing masks, or if they're far apart like this. Unfortunately, my computer skills are not that fancy. I couldn't add masks on these tiny birds. Um, so what do we need to work around? We need to work around the distance, the masks, the smaller groups that we might have, any lost learning skills, and by lost learning skills here, I mean um, the autonomy, the idea that um, uh, organizing your time, organizing, reflecting on your metacognitive skills and all of these things. And finally, any regressed social skills, any skills that they've forgotten about, um, how to collaborate, how to take turns, how to listen to each other. So what do we need to do now? I'm just looking at the time, okay. So how do we get this done and how do we work around this? As I mentioned before, um, these are not going to be, these are not new things. Um, these are just our way to ease back our learners in the classroom to things that they were already doing. Um, throughout the uh, live experience conference, you'll find a lot of teachers giving you specific activities and warmers and things we can do in a distance. But what I'm trying to do in my session is kind of highlight or re-highlight certain principles or ideas that you can take with you um, and instead of going home and thinking I want to do x y and z thinking how can I do x y and z or now I know what I need to do to get x y and z so the, for the one of the first things for example that I've heard a lot of uh, worries from teachers is how are we going to make sure that te learners are actually learning in the classroom how do we make sure that they're following the right path uh, how do we check their understanding? When I cannot monitor, I can't go between them, uh, I can't get close to them, um, I can't see what they're doing so closely. So the idea of formative assessment or diagnostic assessment or continuous assessment and the idea of self-evaluation. I think a lot of teachers are really concerned about this because it's a big element in engagement. It's a big element of ownership, of inquiry. Um, and of course, we can, we can do so many things for that. We can do... Um, some things using ICT and technology and some simple things. So one of them could be using polls and I've seen a lot of this being used on Zoom or different ways or even just, you know, old school polls without really using any software for it. Mini whiteboards, um, so giving each student allocating one whiteboard for them and when you're asking questions or you're checking understanding, instead of having to go one by one, they can quickly write short answers for them to see from afar. Um, using Quizlets, using Kahoots, so many ways to get them to check that they're on the right track. And this kind of ticks the boxes of inquiry because they're really reflecting and thinking and inquiring about their own progress, uh, thinking about their own learning and the idea of ownership, that they are um, feeling responsible on their, about their own learning. The next thing is obviously a classic way that we always used to try to engage our learners to make sure that they're on a continuum of activities is task-based learning, which is basically what would normally happen is that the students would work together, normally in a group, to work on a specific task. And this task could be um, creating a poster or having a debate or creating a presentation or coming up with a decision um, and all of these things. And obviously there's a lot of challenges here as well. The idea that they can't share materials, the idea that you can't monitor, 
Um, the, the idea is that they can't speak when they're so close to each other. Um, and there's different ways to get around this. And one of them is, for example, having them work in different stations and then having them have staggered starts. So while one group starts working on one stage, the other one's working on another stage, which gives you a bit more flexibility in monitoring and in tracking that everybody's on the right place. Uh, noisy cafes, um, having them work kind of loudly, um, if you can afford it, if your space allows it, or if you have access, for example, to sports areas in your school or university, or if you can take them outside. Um, I've done a lot of um, training in Saudi Arabia, as Matt has mentioned, and what's really notable there is that their campuses at university have a lot of outdoor space, and maybe this is the time for us to use this space to get them to sit far apart or stand far apart, but talk comfortably. The idea of collaborative annotation. So, so many amazing websites and apps that you can use now where they can actively read the document together and start making their comments, even if they're not sat very close together. Um, if we're talking about logistics and managing how we're sitting, we can have a fishbowl setup, which is mainly um, dividing your group into two different uh, groups, subgroups. Uh, so the main group in the middle will be sat in a circle and they'll be the participants and the ones outside will be the observers, if you want to call them. So while the ones in the middle perform the task, let's say it's again a debate or presentations, the other one is observing. So again, we're all working together. We're all listening and close, but not too close, of course. Again, depends on your space, depends on your number, um, it depends on your regulation. Um, and then finally, giving time extension. So you need to be really, really um, realistic here as we go back, because as I said before, students have so much more time at home to process things. They're not used to the time now being divided amongst many of them in one place. So you need to, in the beginning, to allocate more time um, for, for these things in the classroom. And again, if we do this the right way, we have hit collaboration, they're working together, we've hit inquiry, they're questioning, they're thinking, they're analyzing, and then the ownership aspect, because they're part of a team, they feel responsible uh, about their own learning, responsible about their own production. And finally, project-based work. Um, now, the difference between this and task-based learning is project-based work is a bit more lengthy. So this is, for example, when they are working on a complete project, so they'll go from the brainstorming stage to collecting data, to editing, to thinking, to um, working, to proofreading, you know, a whole thing. And it's, I mean, I say proofreading, but it's not just about writing. It could be um, uh, a speaking, it could be um, creating text, creating different things. So how do we get around project work as well when we can't get close to each other? Um, again, distance stations, having them work on different parts of an activity or a project at different parts of the room, um, and maybe having to make that sacrifice instead of working in groups, working in pairs, which makes mixing a bit less here, uh, using outdoor spaces, as I said. And I think one of the most useful tools that a lot of us have used now is virtual boards. So padlets and jam boards, which is basically a whiteboard in the tip of your, um, at the tip of your fingers using your iPad or phone or computer. And then this can be projected on their screen where they share ideas. Um, and I'd like to point out here that, you know, a lot of, I've had a lot of teachers kind of criticize this approach saying, but why are we using these apps? We use them online and now we're bringing them back to the classroom and using apps again, it defeats the purpose. But the difference here is that when they were online, they were using uh, the online platform or these websites or apps as a medium. Um, so it was, you know, the whole thing was online or using tools, uh, you know, ICT tools. But now that we're going back to the classroom, these are just tools. These are just momentarily bits of your day or of your classroom session. They're still interacting. They're still looking in each other's eyes. They're still picking up on the body language. They're still forming these bonds that they couldn't form online. So there's no shame in using what you've used online. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing what you did before, but just tweaking it to work for this context. Um, so yeah, again, if we're using uh, project-based work, again, we've done collaboration, we've done inquiry, we've done ownership. Really, there's so much that we can do together in groups. There's so much we can do collaboratively. Just because we're sitting a little bit further apart doesn't mean that it can't be done. Um, yes, somebody's asking me about MCS focus, so focus on metacognitive skills. The idea of having them reflect on their learning throughout, thinking, um, asking them questions like, how did I work, do this task when I was online, and how do I do it now? How do I feel about this experience now versus then? Having these conversations early on as they go back into the classroom will really help, again, ease them in, get them more comfortable. So, 
the idea is, as I just said now, which ties very well with the um, focus on the metacognitive skills, is that we need to have these honest conversations with our students. We need to ask them how they feel um, and how they felt before and why they feel how they feel now, um, because that will play a big role in making that um, transition back into the classroom. So we need to ease them in. We need to hold their hands, but not really because of COVID. You're not allowed to hold anybody's hand. Um, you know, take some more time, put in some more effort just to get them more comfortable back with the situation. Um, add in a lot of variety and ex um, excitement. Um, a lot of students will come in a bit apprehensive about this whole new situation. So we need motivation. We need to keep them gripped. We need to keep them excited. And this excitement and this variety needs to be present in both your methods and your materials. So it's not about bringing different handouts every day. It's about how you deliver your session, how you interact, what kind of methods um, you have and what do you bring into the classroom. So just a few notes to get us thinking before I wrap up for any Q&A that we might have. Um, so as we move forward, there's a few things that you need to remember. And that's you, by the way, the teachers um, uh, moving forward. You need to stay humble. You need to remember that this is, again, I don't want to say brand new, but this is something you wish that you're going back to um, in the classroom. So it's fine. You're human. If it doesn't work on day one or day two, it's not a problem. You learn for it. But the problem is if you don't learn after day one and day two and week one and week two. So you need to reflect. You need to examine and re-examine these gaps. Think about what's missing. Think about what worked and what didn't. Um, go back to your early days of teaching, how your trainer, that mean CELTA trainer or whoever that was that kept asking you to fill in your anticipated problems and solution because now more than ever, we need to think about these problems and solutions. And the more we think about them, the smoother our lessons will be because we'll be prepared, we'll be empowered. Grow and support each other as teachers and grow and support each other as learners because again, we're all learning and supporting each other. And if COVID has showed us anything is how, how, how good we are at learning things very, very quickly. There's a wealth of information out there um, Cambridge alone has provided a ton of sessions that you can find on YouTube and a ton of booklets that you can download completely for free talking about different activities and different ways to engage your learners. Reflect and adapt. Think about how you did this six months ago before you had to go online and just adapt it. That's it. That's all you need. It's not a completely new territory. You're already good at this. You got this. You just need to work with it um, and work on um, creating quality education, but at the same time, work on equality, making sure that your students are now um, filling in these gaps that they might have faced throughout this period, because some of them might not have had a great experience and you need to really tweak um, for different students and see what they need. And enjoy being back, really simply, just have fun because it's, I know that the teaching is such a thrill. Um, it's so exciting to see the learners growing. It's so exciting to see them developing and it's so rewarding to see that. Um, and I think a lot of us have missed it. And again, um, simply because we don't know what's coming next. You know, so much has happened. And if, again, this pandemic has shown us anything is how quick change can happen, how quickly it can happen, but how quickly we adapt. Um, and because so many weird things happened as well in 2020, you never know what's coming next. So enjoy this period, enjoy this class um, experience. And um, yeah, that's it. Great. Now that that was absolutely fantastic, you are getting lots of, lots of very happy and positive comments in the chat box about energy, insightfulness, and as always, um, you know, it's just been a real pleasure for me to listen and learn along with everyone else. Um, a few questions in the chat box. Um, they do seem to revolve around a lot of the same theme. And I think one thing that people are asking is really how do you engage the timid students or the students who didn't want to learn online and have trouble for one reason or another, whether it's being shy, being timid, or just not wanting to learn, how do you really engage them? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think um, I wanted to mention that actually in the slides and I forgot. The idea is about the topics that you bring in at this stage as well. So as we go back into the classroom, um, we need to kind of have these conversations about how the online experience went and why it worked for them and why it didn't. Of course, these timid and shy ones, you can't really put them on the spot and say, you know, you suffered, why? But having that different, talking about these different scenarios of it worked for me or it didn't, talking about the pandemic, talking about the transition, talking about life at home, um, getting them comfortable with it and, and you know, telling them that it's okay um, will hopefully take them out of that shell. 
um, I'm hoping that we're talking about students that had some level of engagement pre pandemic and they just need to kind of reignite it. So having these conversations with them, even if their level of English might be on a lower level, you can have some of this in Arabic and not Arabic and their L1, whatever that is, um, to just make them comfortable to ease them in again. Okay, great. Um, and there was a lot of, again, you, I know you, you did address this quite, quite thoroughly, but there's a lot of questions of group work and pair work. And are there any specific exercises that you've done that have worked over the years uh, or over the past year, I should say, um, in this, in this um, setting where you get pairs or groups to really bring out the best in, in each other and, and continue that collaborative work? Um, you know, again, as I said, the same things apply to before. Um, setting roles and routines, I think, is a very important thing in making group work work. Um, making sure everybody knows what their role is within a team. Um, so one could be, for example, the spell checker or the timekeeper or the motivator or the data collector. Um, again, that sense of ownership that I have a job to make sure that my team or my group succeeds in their task will make them um, work better. Um, but within this context, for example, a lot, of, a lot of people were concerned about how we can get them to talk in a group when we can't be that close. And I've, I've seen this somewhere the past few days is to get them to talk while they're actually sat in different parts of the room um, by having different cards. So you can give out, for example, group A will all be red, group B will be green, and group C will be yellow. And you'll just spread around these cards. And although they're far apart in the classroom, they can still talk to each other just by standing up and holding that card. It means that they belong to that group. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's very interesting because even when we were online, we still had that group feeling despite physically not being in the same room. So I don't see why being in the same room just a bit further uh, won't give us that group feeling. Great. Um, I think there's a really interesting question, uh, one that we haven't maybe touched on or thought of. Um, someone asked, you know, while students were at home learning, they got used to certain things like having their pet around or you know, just being able to walk to the refrigerator, things like that. So how, when they transition back into the classroom, do we maybe make them feel more comfortable um, and bring some of these things that they got used to having every day? Well, I, I don't see pets going back into schools anytime <laughs> soon, but- Not but in the yeah, Middle East anyway. <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, but yeah, the idea is, I've mentioned this kind of briefly in my talk, uh, the idea of time. I think time is gonna be a big thing uh, the idea that at home we had a lot more time to produce, for example, something, you know, the teacher would tell you, you can work on this text and send it to me within, I don't know how long, but in the classroom, you kind of have to share that. Um, so that kind of comfort, you'd need to, you need to slowly ease them in. Again, I keep saying this, but you need to be aware that you won't be able to achieve, you know, X amount of activities or sessions within that 45 minutes or hour that you have. You need to know that students will still be transitioning back. Um, it depends on your school and your context. If your school or university or wherever you are allows you to make some of these uh, affordances, such as you know bringing in your food into this classroom or whatever that is, then then sure. Uh, but otherwise, I think the main thing is just having, especially for young learners, I would say having a playful feel to the classrooms, which should always be there anyway. Um, a comfortable, playful, supportive environment um, to kind of mimic what they might have had at home. That's great. Um, and there's a, a question from Lizelle. She wants you to explain the noisy cafe technique in more depth, which I kind of agreed to. I think that was a great, great point. Okay. Um, actually, you'll find a full uh, blog post on the Cambridge Better Learning um, website as well. You can read about that more. But the idea is that they're going to be talking and they're just a lot noisier. So it's not, we're not going to be sticking to rules and uh, laws on how loud you can be or who takes turns or whatever. It's just going to come more naturally as if you're sitting in a noisy cafe and having people talk across the room. It's kind of like the cards activity that I just spoke about, but without the cards really. So they can be as loud as they want um, talking to each other, mimicking real life, how you'd be in a noisy cafe uh, rather than, you know, sitting in a structured way saying, you know, Ahmad, you can talk now or Ali, you can talk now or Sally and just letting them really have their way it will be more difficult for you to monitor. Um, but that's one thing I think a lot of teachers are struggling with, uh, the idea of how can I monitor and how can I check? Um, and, and the idea is that you just need to realize and accept the fact that you won't be able to monitor everybody all the time. And let's be honest here, even pre 
uh, distancing. You were never able to monitor everybody at the same time. Um, just say that today I'm going to focus on this and that group or that this and that uh, student, and then next week I'm going to focus on those and those. Um, but yeah, I think we, as, as much as we're trying to ease in our learners, but also a lot of work has to be done on us. The idea that we have to let go of some of our expectations of what the classroom, um, how the classroom will be. No, that's really, I think that's really poignant. And I think, you know, what you mentioned is it, it may not happen on the first day. It might not be the first day or two, but we have to, it is an experiment in so many ways and we have to adapt and learn. And, and really that's what I think teaching and great teaching is about. It's about understanding, you know, the, the day to day and adapting and learning from it. And that's, that's where we all are, I think, in this scenario. Um, yeah. Someone asked a very specific question. I think it's, it's good. It's, what asynchronous tools can we be using to encourage online and hybrid learning? Uh, wow, okay, so I'm not really an expert with online learning, um, but again, there's a ton of things you can do. Sorry, you mean asynchronous tools. So yeah, some of the things that I've mentioned really already on the, um, um, on the presentation now, for example, using um, Google Jamboard, using Padlet and all of these, these kind of create a very asynchronous experience or just simply using Google Sheets and Google Docs, you know, that will give you that asynchronous feeling of everybody collaborating at the same time, they're editing, uh, you're working, they're seeing what their others are writing. Um, and that creates a very um, engaging way. Even if you're teaching online and you have them in breakout rooms, they can still use these kind of um, methods to, to make them all connected in real time or live as if you want to call it that way. Great. Um, I'm going to ask the final question uh, since we do have to wrap it up in, in a few minutes and, and it's something again you mentioned that I think is probably the most important part and it, it's trust. So how do in this setting where everything is confusing, where there are obvious health issues, how do teachers gain their students trust sometimes all over again? I think even if, obviously if you've known a student for a long time, it's already there, but maybe you haven't known them or maybe you've known them briefly. And now in this new world, I think that's, that's really the key for me. And, and I think you said it as well. So how do teachers do that? How do they get their students trust? Um, well, this, I think it depends a lot on the different kind of students that you're talking about. But for example, um, let's say we're talking about young learners or primary students. I think this is this feeling needs to be fostered from a lot of different places. So the teacher, the student, and the parents need to be involved in this. So it needs to be like a, a group thing, a community thing, because students need to feel that their um, that pressure is not there. That I don't, I'm not expected to go to school and get these full marks and get these full grades, etc. Because it's it is a time of uncertainty for everybody, and the teacher telling that or communicating to that to the students. Um, now it works whether we're talking about adults or young learners. You know, again, showing that vulnerability that this is something new for everybody. This is something we're all going through. It's not the end of the world if it doesn't work um, right away. It's going to need tweaking. Um, again, yeah, it's simply just being you, being honest about what you have. Don't go in and put in that face that you are an expert and everything's going to be great and everything's going to work out exactly as, as it is. It's about communication. It's about dialogue between you and your students, no matter their ability or their level or their age. Um, if they see that you're responding to their needs, they're responding to their requests, um, you're catering to their abilities, that trust will gradually be built. Um, it, it's the response, it's the interaction really. That's, that's great, no, and, and I, I completely agree. I think it's the vulnerability and the willingness to, to try things and admit that they didn't work, but fix those things or try something new. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Nala. This has been a fantastic session. The comments couldn't be more positive. Um, and, 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 you know, I think everyone appreciates what you bring and what your insights are. Um, with just very one minute left, I just want to say that my colleague Raz has been posting links for the certificates. So please do get your certificate and please continue to join all these wonderful sessions. Uh, and a huge thank you to Nala for her time and her energy and her preparation. Um, so we will see you guys all at the next session. Thanks thank very, you very much. much. Bye, everybody. Shukran Jazeel. Grazie mille. Gracias. <laughs> all right.